This is Duke University. Banned at first by the NBA because the dramatic color scheme violated the association's design code, and originally disliked by Jordan, who said of the first designs that they looked like devil shoes. Air Jordans have since become the marketing triumph of the sportswear industry, by now famous and infamous for their expense. Air Jordan 6s sold for $125 in 1991, and for their status, famous also for their status as collector's items. Indeed, Nike itself reproduces earlier models in their retro editions. Retros of the Air Jordan 7, originally on the market in late 1991, were released again in 2002 and were released again in 2004. The sneakers themselves have always relied on complex citational design, one inspired by the stealth fighter F-17 used in Desert Storm, many incorporating Jordan's number 23 or his Olympic number 9 into the stitching or the design of the shoe itself, and the Air Jordan 21 released in February 2006, making use of the grill design from the Bentley as inspiration for its side vents. Increasingly, the objects themselves um, seem to have become or seem to have assumed the status of meta-objects. Jungen has commented at some length on the initial stages that led him to the prototype refabrications. He has spoken of being in New York and visiting the Museum of Natural History, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and then Nike Town, where they also present their products in big, hermetically sealed vitrines. I went to the sports store and purchased a number of pairs of Air Jordan sneakers and began to dissect them, which in itself was interesting, and in that it was almost a sacrilegious act, cutting up and destroying these iconic, collectible, and expensive shoes. The emphasis on the iconicity of the shoes is of particular importance because it helps to dramatize what you might call a rival act of recontextualization and appropriation within which the sneakers attain new value or within which the exhibition value of Nikes has been disclosed as having greater priority than any exchange or use value. It was interesting, uh, this is Jungen again, to see how by simply manipulating the Air Jordan shoes, he could evoke specific cultural traditions while sim simultaneously amplifying the process of cultural corruption and assimilation. The Nike mask sculptures seemed to articulate a paradoxical relationship between a consumerist artifact and an authentic native artifact. Rather than Western art being rejuvenated by the incorporation of primitive forms, First Nation art is rejuvenated through the incorporation of the Western commodity, but a commodity that has much of the totemic potency we associate with tribal art. For me, it's useful. I actually think I need to get to another one of the masks. That's perfect. That's perfect. Sorry, that's a little out of focus. Uh, for me, it's useful, however patently Eurocentric and, yes, anthropological, to think about Jungen's cultural corruption, his word, uh, with the help of Lovie Strauss's work on the masks of the Northwest Coast, La Voix des Masques, the way of the masks, the voice of the masks. Lovie Strauss was trying to resolve the discrepancies in form between a particular Salvish mask and a Kwaki Udl mask, we now say um, Kwa Kwakawa, um, concluding that within distinct origin myths for the masks, there are transformational relations that, from a purely plastic point of view, prevail among the masks themselves, thus explaining why the sunken eyes in this mask appear as the protruding eyes in this mask. His ultimate claim was that the masks from different tribes in different locales within the region form part of a system in which each element is the transformation of another. My sense of Jungen's work is that it means, say, to expand the region under anthropological scrutiny and to expose other systems in which artifacts appear as transformations of one another. Which systems? First and most obviously, the art system, where the prototypes invert and recode that appropriative act by which Western art made use of other cultures. Second, the global system of what Pierre Bourdieu has taught us to call cultural capital, given how the prototypes highlight the ways in which Northwest artifacts and Air Jordans look like versions of one another in their iconicity and sign value, indeed, even their value on their market. 
That is, they appear as one another not just plastically, but structurally. Their exhibition, sign, and economic value generally outstrips their use value. Third, the global system of production, distribution, and consumption. Sociologists, political economists, and cultural theorists write so much about Nike because it is one of, because it is one of the first global corporations, both outsourcing its labor and depending on an international market, a market enabled not just by new networks of communication, but also by the appeal of Michael Jordan, who became a global icon. Um, and the sociology of his iconicity, of Jordan's iconicity, um, is especially powerful when, when one um, is reading about New Zealand, um, Vancouver, um, Poland, uh, for instance. By foregrounding craft, the prototypes would seem to draw attention to the human labor congealed in any manufactured artifact, the foreign labor that lies congealed in the American products distributed by Nike. We have another. And then another. OK, good. Of course, the confrontation or conflation of these three object cultures challenges any easy distinction between aboriginal ritual object and iconic postmodern commodity. But it also discloses a certain thingness of the objects that, um, at least so far as I know, has um, eluded the commentary on this work. Attention has been drawn, I think rather predictably, to how the work mobilizes aesthetic and cultural misunderstandings to explore ways to politicize cultural stereotypes in the age of globalization. Jungen himself has spoken eloquently both of the influence of growing up in a household where um, improvisatory recycling was born out of both practical and economic necessity, and of his attempt with the prototypes to transform these objects into a new hybrid object, which both affirms and negates its mass-produced origin and charts an alternative destination, destination to that of the landfill. But the, but the concern with which I want to conclude focuses on the system of our human interaction with material. In Heidegger's famous account of Van Gogh's painting of peasant shoes, he works to discover the equipmental quality, the equipmental being of equipment, the reliability of a pair of shoes, and nothing more. From the dark opening of the worn insides of the shoes, the toilsome tread of the worker stares forth. In the shoes vibrates the silent call of the earth, its quiet gift of the ripening grain, and its unexplained self-refusal in the fallow desolation of the wintry field. But shoes, as Jungen has reconfigured them, disclose a different being, a different thingly feature, a certain uncanniness that unsettles the thing as formed matter for human use. Not on first glance, perhaps, but with some concentration. These works seem so interesting, and all uh, by, these, by these works I mean, yes, these works, but also really much of Jungen's work, um, seem so interesting because they are neither one thing nor the other which is to say by my light that their thingness emerges from a kind of oscillation, neither plastic chairs nor whale skeleton, yet both skeleton and chairs, neither sneakers nor masks, yet both, both masks and sneakers. The relays between these object forms might finally disclose the life and longing of the constituent materials. The oscillation and chance dyed leather into a thing that is in excess of any object form. It allows us to imagine, I think, a world where the materials around us, the denim of your jeans, the glass of your watch crystal, the fabric on your chair seat, has as the object of its desire, perhaps, the desire to be some other object. It is as though Jungen's work discloses a newly animate world, a secret life of things that is irreducible to the object forms in which we have constructed and constricted our world. And it is the recognition of that life, I think, that holds some promise for transforming life as we know it. Thanks. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.